you? Uh, here, I guess, and uh, I went out and picked up a paper. I had to ask Kevin to leave his office and come and pick me up. Well, what are friends for? Yes, and he is a friend, Jerry. He's reliable, he's considerate. He's like your exact opposite. So he's Bizarro Jerry. Bizarro Jerry? Yeah, like Bizarro Superman. Superman's exact opposite. Who lives in the backwards Bizarro world? Up is down, down is up. He says hello when he leaves, goodbye when he arrives. Shouldn't he say bad bye? Isn't that the opposite of goodbye? No, it's still goodbye. Bizarro World, a term coined by comedian Jerry Seinfeld, but also a term that could apply to our world today. Speaking of the world's economy, today is a bizarro world. For example, here's a chart of the gross domestic product numbers of the top nations, national economies of the, of the world. And for example, Japan is the fifth largest economy in the world. And these are the numbers for the 2010 GDP. 2010 GDP numbers for Greece, you see there, Greece being the 37th largest economy in the world in 2010. Now, if we were to put this on a graph to see the correlation between Japan and Greece economies, we would find that this reality. In 2010, in trillions of dollars, Japan's GDP was over $10 trillion, while Greece's was under $400 billion. However, when we look at last year's 2011 graph of the Dow Jones Industrial Averages, which honestly today we could go back and uh, look at 2011 graph of many major economy of the world, we'd see the same pattern. We could almost superimpose the graphs. Let's look at the Dow Jones for last year. And I want to draw your attention to a couple s specific points of the Dow Jones as we're coming along January, look at January of 2011, where we were at this point, we're coming along. The green course is up swings in the, in the economy. Uh, red is down drafts. And we see right here in March of last year, there was a rather serious downdraft. It was a 300-point decline. Not terribly serious, but uh, it... it it, it scared a few people, a few investors, but you see right afterwards, it just came, bounced right back, and then even grew way up to um, the highest point of the 2011 year. Now, something happened here, and you know what it was? Let me refresh your memory. That's right the tsunami hit Japan. What a horrible, horrible, unimaginable, destructive force that impacted the nation of Japan and the world. It even included an atomic meltdown with millions of gallons of radioactive waste pumped or runoff from that into the ocean with side effects that will be felt for generations to come. It was unreal. I remember I was in my office that Thursday night uh, while Kay was teaching uh, the ladies and uh, the Beth Moore video series studies and a news flash came across my computer that said there had been a 
earthquake in Japan. And I thought, 9.0? You've got to be kidding. That is that is catastrophic in nature. I went on the major news outlets in the States, couldn't find any coverage of it, just the bulletin that they'd had a 9.0 earthquake. So I googled uh, live feeds and found a Japanese live feed and watched that unfold. In fact, last week, for you that were here in our first uh, study, uh, I showed you the video, basically the video footage that I, I watched live. I could not believe it. This was happening live. In fact, the big wave that swept across those huge, huge farm fields, it took me a little while to realize those are those little specks in there are houses. They're, 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 they're buildings, vehicles. And I even called the ladies in from the Bible. So I said, you got to watch this. This is happening right now as we're watching. Well, the world economy had a reaction to that type of destruction happening to the fifth largest economy in the world. And dear ones, this was that reaction. A 300 point loss in the Dow Jones. Now, that's bizarro. Well, no, you might say, Pastor, just a minute. This is the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, however, you need to know a little more about the fifth largest economy in the world. But before we go there, I'd like to just show you what I ran across today as I prepared this study. I was uh, looking at, at uh, Fox News and and found this this bulletin news bulletin. You know what this is? Well, this is there's Japan, and here's the west coast of the United States. Here's where we are. Okay, now this is news that came out today. Do you know what this you know what this is right here? Well that was taken from satellite imagery showing the, the all the, the debris that is coming to it went, came into the ocean from the tsunami. You know, as a wave hits a tsunami wave hits, then uh, then uh, uh, there is going to be the the backwash, I mean the taken out to sea, and that's that's the debris from the tsunami. But watch this. Let me put this in motion, and watch what has happened since last year's tsunami. Whoops! I have too many zeros on here. Sorry, it's actually twenty-five, not twenty-five billion, but twenty-five million tons of debris during this less than a year time frame have made it has made its way across the Pacific Ocean and is bumping up on our coast. This is the latest imagery of today of this 25 million tons of debris that will be soon washing up on a beach near you. Now these 25 million tons of debris include cars and buildings and and unimaginable radioactive material and yet dear ones in our bizarro world the fifth largest economy in the world now the largest economy in the world about ready to get hit with all this debris and yet what happens to our blessed wall street well we get a 300 point drop but don't worry right afterwards it went way up way up to the highest point of 2011 market. So that's one aspect of our bizarre world. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's bizarro time. But then when you put all of this in light of the fact that before the tsunami, the $10.3 trillion GDP 
of Japan actually reflects only one half of Japan's debt. In other words, Japan before the tsunami was already upside down 200%. Let me explain it another way. It would take two years of all of the GDP of Japan to be applied towards its debt to pay off the country's debt. That is phenomenal, dear ones. And that economy that was already that much upside down took a hit like the tsunami hit. And it didn't make a bleep on the world economy screen. Boy, we must have a much more robust economy in the world than I'm understanding. After all, I'm just a preacher. I'm not an economist. But then, just to enhance my conclusion that we are living in a bizarro world, four months later, let me put it here, all of this tsunami upside-down economy in Japan, all this stuff, had a 300-point drop that immediately was replaced with tremendous growth that went clear up to the large, highest level of 2011. Now let me show you another dip in last year's markets. Whoa! What tsunami caused this? Well, dear ones in our bizarre world, it wasn't a tsunami. You know what it was? It wasn't 25 million tons of debris, of radioactive debris that we're going to have to deal with for generations to come. No, what took the economy down in the world, the global economy, in the Dow Jones had a 2,000 point correction, was based on, are you ready? <laughs> Bizarro time! It was based on rumors. That's right. The tsunami in the fifth largest world country that was already 200% of its GDP upside down barely was noticed on the radar screen and yet rumors about the fact that Greece, oh yes, the 37th largest economy in the world, that Greece might default on their debt loan. Ah, oh, panic time. And the Dow Jones had a 2,000 point correction as was reflected around the world in all the economies from Europe to Asia. To South America. Now, dear ones, that's Bizarro World. Hmm. So let's look at what a trillion dollars is. After all, we hear it so much nowadays, we've... We, do you know what a trillion dollars is? Remember, it wasn't that long ago, but we never mentioned trillions. It was all in billions. Now we mention trillions. And now we just throw trillions around. Oh, well, the national debt now is, what, top $15 trillion? Oh, oh well, what's a trillion? Here's a trillion dollars for you to understand a little bit what we're looking at. After all, inquiring Upland First Church Nazarenes may want to know. Let's start with a $100 bill. Currently, the largest U.S denomination and general circulation. Most everyone has seen them, uh, slightly fewer have owned them, and they're guaranteed to make friends wherever they go. Hundred dollar bill. Now keep that in mind, a hundred dollar bill. What can you buy for a hundred dollars? Now, now if we were to get a stack of one hundred dollar bills and um, have ten thousand dollars total, what would that look like? Well, you could easily put it in your pocket. It would be a half an inch thick, and uh, so not that much. Now, 
keep that in mind. That's a $10,000. Now, what would a million dollars look like? Well, a million dollars would easily fit in a grocery bag. You could carry you could carry it around. And uh, can you imagine uh, the ushers? Can you imagine Oscar if you were um, if you were taking the offering up that morning and someone were to make a million dollar donation and put it in the offering plate? Uh, that would be quite something to carry, but you could easily carry it. Uh, and so a million dollars. There's a million dollars. That gives, gets you an idea. Now, how much, How what it would look like to be a billion dollars? A billion dollars. Okay, well, a million dollars isn't that impressive looking. How about a hundred million? Well, that's a little more respectable. Uh, it would, uh, actually fit on a standard pallet if it's stacked about a little over three feet high and uh, so yeah you'd need uh, Matt Stevens truck to carry a hundred million dollars well what would a billion dollars look like well a billion dollars would be ten pallets Okay, that would be a billion dollars. Let's look at a trillion. It's a million, million. It's a thousand billion. It's, well, it's one followed by 12 zero. This is what a trillion dollars would, I give you a trillion dollars. Now pay attention. Look at the guy in that little corner. The pallets are taller than he is. And they extend almost as far as the eye can see. And notice this. The pallets are double stacked. Instead of being the one pallet that we saw that would fit into Matt's pickup, now they're too high. They're taller than the guy himself. He's just a little... You, you can, we can't even get our minds around it. That's a trillion dollars. Now, let me highlight the trillion dollars. A trillion dollars are hundred dollar bills stacked on pallets like this. That's a trillion dollars. Okay. I give you the current indebtedness of our world. There's one trillion dollars. Now this is our world's indebtedness. Global indebtedness is this. That's right. The global indebtedness, are you ready? The global indebtedness is $39 trillion. That's our global indebtedness. As you see, this is a global... You've seen the debt clock of America. You've seen it probably on the news and stuff, clicking... A, it's in New York City, Times Square, the debt clock, the official debt clock of the United States. Well, you know there's a debt clock of the world. You should see it clicking off. That tsunami, we hadn't even began to feel the effect of much of the tsunami effect. Wait till all this stuff starts playing out. And then I come back to the point, and yet... Look at when a rumor of the 37th largest economy in the world, Greece's little dinky economy, in proportion to the rest of the world's economy, a rumor took the Dow Jones and the global markets down almost a fifth of their value overnight. A rumor. To me, 
dear ones. That's Bizarro World. Now the reason I'm going into such details about the economy is because all of this can be found in prophecy. That's why this course of study that we're going to be looking at will be looking at very practical realities of our world today and how we can look in Scripture and find in Scripture what's going on. You see, in Wall Street, uh, not, not in Washington, I mean, our congressmen have, have it made because they are able to know legislation before it becomes law and can play the market accordingly. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing insider information plays. Recently, a key congressperson just overnight made made mega bucks over playing the market knowing that legislation that was going to be introduced and would pass was going to happen and positioned uh, herself accordingly to make a windfall profit. Well, that's called insider information. In Wall Street, it's illegal. In, uh, in Washington, it's, it's legal. And there, there is a move to try to change that. But dear ones, you and I as children of the Most High, who are students of the Word of God, are privy to insider information. We can know what's coming down the pike. Isn't that amazing? And so this next graph doesn't, shouldn't shock any of us. Okay, the world economy shouldn't be shocking to us that it's about ready to collapse, enter into meltdown mode, because the word told us that would be the scenario in the last days, and we'll be looking into that in a very practical way. And the reason that um, the world economy is, is on this tailspin and we'll be looking into those uh, aspects and what the ramifications of those are. But you know what this graph is? You know what this graph reflects? Okay. Well, let me point out a couple little details here. First of all, this is 1973 level. 1974, 75, 76, 77, okay. 92. Are you seeing? Uh, we started getting some increase bumped up here in 92. Look at that. Oh, and 95. Boy, oh, okay. And then we get up to, uh, okay, whoa, whoa. Boy, look what happened in 2008. Whoa! Now, what's this graph reflect? Are you ready for this? This graph reflects earthquakes of over 3.0 in the global scale globally, that were over 3.0 on the, on the scale, rector scale. So what you have here is in 73, you had this many earthquakes in the world of over 3.0. Look what's that. But this should not surprise us, dear ones. After all, we have insider information that this would exactly be the case. And we'll get into that prophecy, where the earthquakes earthquakes would all of a sudden increase like labor pains before the end. Well, I don't know about you, but that's sure. And you can't say, oh, well, they didn't have measuring devices. In 73, we were already pretty sophisticated and pretty globally covered in our, in, in our measuring devices. Now, true, we've, but this does not justify this. There's something strange happening. Well, if you're privy to insider information, you can know what the, that strange something is. There, there is something strange going on in our world. Okay. So, what's this map of the world represent? Okay. Well, this is wars. Wars that have claimed over 1,000 people last year. 
this I should say 2010 figures over a thousand victims over a thousand victims in all these nations look all these nations where over a thousand people were killed from wars last year now that's what we have record of over a thousand victims of wars the purple were major upheavals in those countries but on record we don't have more than a thousand or they'd be put in black there talk about wars everyone talking peace 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 and look at all the wars breaking out and it has everything to increase in number and intensity oh well what are these well, insider information would tell you what we're dealing with here. Dear ones, in the time it took for those four pictures to slide by, are you ready? Over 10 children in the world starved to death. 10 in the time those pictures passed starved to death. In our high-tech world, when we are burning crops to keep prices artificially high, in our bizarro world, we could feed the world many times over with the technology we have but because of sin because of power plays political games starvation increasing at an alarming rate in the world of course we who are privy to insider information already knew that so let's look back over our little study tonight Global financial realignment. I'm going to speak a little more about that in just a second, but just look at this. Earthquakes, wars, hunger. Does that sound like something you've heard in the scriptures? Like um, maybe in the Olivet Discourse, the focus of our study on these Wednesday nights? We're going to be looking at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There, as I pointed out last week, there are 2,900 verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 6% of them are repetitive, and it has to do with the Olivet Discourse. It's the words of our Master shortly before Calvary. The final days before Calvary... He took his disciples aside from the multitudes that surrounded him constantly. And he taught them the, this, this tremendous teaching called the Olivet Discourse. The thing I find tremendously intriguing is the number, the percentage of verses dedicated to last times. And it's a passage that we rarely hear from pulpits today. We don't want to talk about it. And yet Jesus found it so important. You know when someone's about to die, how their final words are always looked upon with such such a desire to know maybe that will help and comfort or something. And, uh, and, and Jesus was within hours of dying on the cross. And he found that this subject was that important that he, through his Holy Spirit, inspired the writers of the Gospels to include, almost verbatim, three of them. In fact, that's why I've put the Synoptic Gospels side by side in our handout here. So we're going to be working through this whole teaching of Jesus, his words. His words. We're not going to. We're not going to have to uh, uh, use a lot of imagination because he told us exactly what would be the birth pangs of his return. Just like the Virgin Mary suffered birth pangs when Jesus was born, 
Jesus said that the world would suffer birth pangs before his return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so what we have here is signs of his coming and the increasing intensity of those signs the closer we, be, we came to his return. He says we would not know the day or the hour, just like a mother going through a natural childbirthing procedure doesn't know the exact day or the hour, even though the doctor can give her a, a, maybe a time frame to look at. But no, she doesn't know the day or the hour. And we won't know the day or the hour he returns, but we'll know it's getting close just by the signs. Just by the signs of the times. And when we get to that point in the teaching, I want to go into my limited knowledge of childbirth through the Lama's teaching that Kay and I went through and what I learned about it. The signs of a birth. This time, the signs of the coming. They're going to be so clear. It's going to be obvious we are so close. And look at these graphs. Look at this figure. Look at the things that are happening. So this is just an introductory material that we're going to be looking at the Olivet Discourse verse by verse. And we'll get hopefully get started tonight on that. But uh, global financial realignment. Let me go one step further to talk about that just a second. Because wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, hunger. Okay, those are givens. We, we understand that. But the economy, let me return to it before going on. And we'll have to revisit this later when we come to this point in Jesus' teaching. But let's look at the Brazilian economy as an example. Okay? Before we do that, I want to put these bills on there. Okay. Now, if you examine these carefully, you'll see on this upper right corner, right hand corner, you'll see the figure of 500,000 and it's 500 mil cruzeiros. 500 mil cruzeiros. And yet, do you see this stamp right here? Sort of like a rubber stamp. It says 500 cruzeiros reais. Inflation back in the late 80s and early 90s of Brazil was completely out of control. One month, Kay and I remember that the inflation rate hit 45%. Translation, if you got paid on the first of the month, Brazilians get paid once a month. It's crazy, I know, but they would get paid once a month, even with 45% a month inflation. You get paid at the first of the month. You have the cash. That cash is worth only 55% of what you received at the first of the month at the last of the month. Are you following the logic? In other words, what it would take to buy on the first day of the month, you would need 45% more to buy the same amount at the last part of the month. All of this has given me a whole different perspective of the value of money, a perspective that most Americans don't have. Can you imagine seeing, if, make this a, um, a dollar, $500,000 dollars and you may not even be able to buy a loaf of bread with it can you can you picture that a half a million dollars won't even buy a loaf of bread well then if that ever became the tr reality lies in the Weimar Republic Dan you you know you've told me many times Dan Decker about the Weimar Republic of how a wheelbarrow one example he told me about I thought was so interesting that a man went to a store with a wheelbarrow of money to buy a loaf of bread or something 
and he couldn't get the wheelbarrow of money, loaded with money, in the door, so he had to leave the wheelbarrow outside the door. When he came out, he had been robbed. Can you believe it? The money was still there. Someone had stolen the wheelbarrow. Now, dear ones, when you get your economy gets to that shape, you're in bad shape. And what Brazil did in its economy was simply to, out of nothing, create new money. They said, now, instead of being cruzeiros, the new money, the new currency is cruzeiros reais. And 500,000 old cruzeiros, 500,000, half a million, is the same as 500 new cruzeiros reais. Dear ones, Brazil went through four currencies in a 10-year period of time. They had to invent names of their new currency. For instance, this was the next currency. Do you see this over here? The name was Cruzeiros. Then came Cruzeiros Reais. And then Cruzados. And then came Cruzados Novos. Do you see the Cruzados Novos stamp? This is in about a 10-year period of time. One thing you didn't do was save money, because you had nothing when you saved it. Until you came to the present. Hey, Al. Now, in 92, the inflation craze in Brazil ended in 1992, when the hey, Al was introduced. Now, why, how was the hey, Al, the hey, ice... This is 10 hay ice, 1 real, 5 hay ice, 10 hay ice. That's still today. If you went to Brazil today, this is what you would deal in, and there's this currency here. And dear ones, this has been almost 20 years. What happened? What stabilized the economy? I'll tell you what stabilized the economy. Vast deposits of dollars, billions of dollars, American dollars, deposited in banks that secured the value of the local economy. It basically, they created their own gold standard. Only instead of gold, it was based on dollars. It's what secured the Brazilian economy. Well, dear ones, when you collapse the dollar, what do you do with that local economy? I would submit to you with a $39 trillion indebtedness. Remember? $39 trillion indebtedness. The days of the dollar are just about over. And what's going to happen? They're going to have to create a new currency. Well, what currency will that be? Another thing I learned during all this time in Brazil of these currencies being changed over, another thing I learned was the following that it takes a long time to introduce a new currency if it has security issues embedded in it. In other words, if you're just printing press money, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to be worth anything anyway. But if you try to embed some kind of um, like electronic tape of some kind, it, it, it's what most of your currencies in the world have. They have, if you look at a euro, that has a several security issues to, because today's sophisticated copying forms uh, in a, in Brazil, I noticed when they were introduced a new economy with new currency, they found out that within hours there would be so much falsified currency circulating in the country it would devalue the real currency right out of the gate because you have a bunch more of it than is guaranteed, and so. What you have there is the facility, and the people are not familiar with the new currency, so they would take the falsified currency, think they were taking the new currency. What a mess. But the euro taught us something. Now, dear ones, the euro's only been on the market for a little over 10 years as a currency. Now, it's been in the market longer, but as a currency, it took three years for them to print enough euros to introduce the euro to the public. 
For three years, the euro only existed electronically. Now, think for a second. The demand of the euro when it was introduced in 2001. Okay, here, now you can go buy a, a hundred, even a 500 euro note. Can you imagine? 500 euro note. It took them three years to print enough after the euro already existed electronically. Transfers were done electronically. There wasn't much demand, dear ones, for the euro. In fact, they've had a hard time selling the whole idea of the euro in Europe itself, much less around the world. So there was no demand for euros. Can you imagine the dollar collapsing, the demand? You know, they would have to print for a hundred years enough to be able to fill the void the dollar is going to leave once it collapses in its value. Dear ones, I would submit to you, they're not going to introduce a new currency. It's going to be electronic. It's the only way. If the dollar collapsed tomorrow, we'd have a time of just chaos, global chaos. Then they would come out with a new globalized economy. And I present to you, dear ones, the mark of the beast. But we'll get there in due season. Now, the insider information is so phenomenal. Jesus telling his disciples in John chapter 16. Now, you've got to understand, these words were given by Jesus. Some of the last words recorded, because John 17, 7, John 17 is actually the high priestly prayer. When he's praying the prayer for his disciples, and for us, remember, I pray not only for these, my disciples, but for those who are to follow, who are to believe. He was praying for the church at that time. He was praying for us. But after that prayer, they left the upper room, and where they had had the supper. We call it the Last Supper, because that was his last supper before the crucifixion. And uh, they left the room, they went to the Mount of Olives for the prayer time. You remember the whole thing where he was arrested in the wee hours. So his final instructions, recorded instructions to his disciples took place in that supper, at that supper. And this is what he said to his disciples. And remember also that Judas had already left. So this was just the church. This was just his faithful followers. Here we go. I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Put it in our terms. I've told you, you dear ones in Upland, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Listen to what he said to his disciples. They will ban you from the synagogues. Talking about religious persecution. You know, now in the United States, you can be anything but a born-again Christian. If you're a born-again Christian, you're a radical you need to be, you need to be watched. Oh, how far we've come. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you, who? My disciples, will think he is offering service to God. Oh my, we're in for trouble, church. That's why I said to you, <laughs> Uh, for the two Sundays that I preached on the second coming from the pulpit, that's going to be for everyone. I mean, that's something you can get, the blessed hope of his appearing. But you brave ones that come here on Wednesday nights to get this information, this insider information, you have to be the let's roll congregation. You know, the ones that, even though we're going to go down in a, in a, in a pall of fire, our plane is going to hit the ground, we're going to go down fighting. Let's roll. Todd Beamer type people where I said like uh, comparing it to Schultz and Hogan I see nothing I know nothing now most of the Church of Jesus Christ is like that I don't want to hear about it I don't want to say it. but there's some of us that say hey you know if this is coming and where this is inevitable maybe there's something I could prepare to help others that will be totally unprepared for the chaos that's soon to follow and so this is this is pretty strong stuff. This is not for the weak hearted, this or the feeble feeble need. No, this is for the the ones that want to go down fighting. And so here we go. In fact, a time is coming, dear ones, for you 
Todd Beamer type people, for you Hogan type people that are always looking for something. A time is coming when anyone kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But listen to this. Here's the insider information. But I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you may remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning. Because